Good morning. I'm so thankful you are welcoming us into your homes this morning. We're glad to be with you. Today's message is about enduring troubles and suffering. By my calculations, we've been at this coronavirus, COVID-19, about 12 weeks, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, I don't know, but it, it has thrown us a curve, hasn't it? You know, we as Christians, we ask the big questions. God, why is this happening? What, what lessons do you want us to learn from uh, in, enduring this coronavirus? And what purposes are you working out among your people? You know, we do ask those big questions because we know that God's overall. And he is trying to help us see some things that maybe we haven't seen before. So here we are to worship God. He wants us to be faithful, to trust him, to love our neighbor. Let's worship him with heart, mind, and soul. Let's give him his due this morning. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. To God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in an approachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. We now sing, crown him with many crowns. Spend this time confessing our sins to God our Father, King of all kings and God of all mercy. Come to the aid of your people. We confess that we have not always lived as we ought to live. We have responded to the call of our sinful nature and the temptations of Satan. We now take some quiet moments for personal prayer and confession. Merciful Heavenly Father, we confess to you and to one another our sinfulness. We have not loved you with our whole heart and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have been selfish in our actions and thoughtless in our words. Have mercy on us, O God, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, forgive our sins. When you call, 
Give us ears to hear your voice and courage to listen. Give us faithfulness to follow you and self-control when we want our own way. May we show your love toward all we meet in our journey. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You know, friends, when we read that confession, I don't know about you, but when I see those words like selfish or that I haven't loved God or my neighbor as I should, it, 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 it hurts. It's frustrating. I, I tend to beat my own self up and go, man, how could I? Maybe you do the same. Um, I, I pray that we see the power of what those words are saying, that we can't save ourselves. We don't have it all together. But instead, friends, I want to tell you some really good news. Probably the greatest news you've ever received, and for sure you, that you will receive this week. And that is this. Jesus has given you and I forgiveness. Even though we have sinned against him and against those that we care about and love in this world, he forgives us. He says you're redeemed and restored. And so that's the good news you have, that Jesus has forgiven you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now the psalm of praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let us praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the spirit of truth whom you promised from the Father, for you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. We now are led um, through the Apostles' Creed by Chris, Kristen and Jack McGee. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now the word of God uh, read to us by Stephanie Schoenfelder. The first reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John, and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Elpheus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devouting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about a hundred and twenty and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, 
which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with this reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, with all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who had been accompanying us during all this time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us to be witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barbarus, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The second reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, and chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for, it is time for judgment to be at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to faithful Creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around you like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel is from John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you are the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave out the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is for you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came to you, and they believe that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey kids, gather around because it's time for the children's message led by our own Frida Guthrie. Hi guys. 
I'm so happy to see you all today. So today we're going to talk about snakes. Now I know snakes can make you feel anxious. They sure do me. But then I try to remember that God made snakes just like he did me. So they have to have a purpose, right? Now a neat fact about a snake is this. They can have up to 300 bones in their spine. I know sometimes the way they move around, it's as if they don't have any, just like this stuffed one here. But they do. Now another neat thing about a snake is this. They shed their skin. As the snake grows, its skin does not. It just gets tighter and tighter. Kind of like some of us in our genes during this pandemic. Now, what the snake does is when it's ready and the skin is too tight, it will rub its head against something hard like a rock. Then the snake, the snake skin splits, and it starts peeling off, and the snake slides right out, and it casts its skin behind. Now, that brings us to today's lesson. In 1 Peter 5, we hear this verse, cast all your worries on him because he cares for you. You know, the Bible teaches us that we can pray about all of the things that worry us and we can give it to God and he will take them from us. One thing that I do that really helps me a lot when I worry is this. I pray to God. I tell him all that is bothering me. I tell him I know I can't fix it myself and I need his help. Sometimes I even imagine myself lifting up all of my problems and giving them to him right then and right there. And you know what he does in return? He takes them and he gives me his peace. And I feel so much better. The point of today's message is this. Families, don't carry your worries with you. Give them to God. He wants to hear them. Cast them away. And go on throughout your day. Enjoy this beautiful world that God has given you. Families, this week, think about all the things you can give to God. Pray about them. Give them to him and cast them aside. And in return, God will give you his peace and you will feel so much better. We now sing our hymn of the day, When Peace Like a River.
May only his word be spoken, only his word heard. Amen. Because of him from 1 Peter chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now, our scripture this morning begins with the word beloved. Now, that's not a word we often use today, hardly at all, I'm sure. But if we were to use it, we would use it with those we have an intimate relationship with, those we love the most, beloved. This reminds me that all of the New Testament are are really love letters to us from God. Through Peter, the Lord is saying, to you whom I love, I don't want you to be surprised. Surprised by all kinds of troubles and, and suffering. He uses the word fiery trial. Surely, uh, Peter had in mind, while he was writing these uh, letters, the whole thing that happened under Nero, the Caesar. A great fire had overtaken the city of Rome. It destroyed so much of it. Nero, who had killed his own mother, murdered his own mother, was a paranoid, immature, and, and violent ruler of of the Romans. He, wanting to excuse himself for this fire and any responsibility for it, blamed the Christians. Tacitus, the Roman historian, said he did this to remove all suspicion from himself and according to the same historian that he rounded up Christians, brutally executing them, And I quote here what Tacitus says, throwing them to the beasts, crucifying them, and burning them alive. The popular legend has it that Nero played the fiddle as Rome burned. Today, perhaps the greatest objection to the uh, Christian faith is this. Why would a loving God allow pain and suffering to happen to so-called good people or innocent people. Now, there's an assumption there, isn't there, that there are good people and innocent people. And yet the objection goes, if he is all-powerful and all-loving, why doesn't he stop it? Long ago, there was a uh, comedian, for some of you not so long ago, named uh, Bob Hope. And Bob Hope would entertain the troops during World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and uh, he was given an award one time, and he held up the award, and he said, I really don't deserve this, but I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either. Um, That's the reaction of many people, I think. God, why am I suffering so? Why has this happened to me or that happened to me? In our comfort-loving country, many false expectations and false ideas arise about being a Christian. I want you to try some of these on. True Christians always have a better marriage. That's not true. In fact, if you're a true Christian, a faithful Christian, and you marry a difficult person, you're going to have a difficult marriage. True Christians have less pain in their lives because Christ is with them. I don't find that to be true either. True Christians are wealthier than non-Christians. Worldwide, if you look at it, there are many, many, many desperately poor people who, who claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. True Christians don't get discouraged. True Christians no longer struggle with sin, doubt, and fear. True Christians don't need medications because God will heal them. True Christians are always motivated to pray and serve and love. Not one of these statements is true. Not one. What is true is that Christians don't escape reality, but they come together as a church, as people of God, to face reality. You see, in repentance and striving, we encourage one another, we build up one another, we love one another, clinging to that connection we have in Jesus Christ. Now, the Scriptures bring us truth and reality. And I want to talk to you about three main realities. 
The first great reality is that we live in a fallen world, in rebellion against God, and the slavery of sin still has captured the majority of people. Also, even us Christians have made a mess of this world through hatred, violence, greed, and immorality. And it all started with Adam and Eve. But into this fallen world, a Savior has come to liberate us. And of course, that Savior is Jesus Christ. He means to bring us back to God, to the hope, the love, the joy, the peace that God wants us ultimately to have in our lives. The second major reality is that we who believe follow a crucified Savior. We don't follow some triumphant general, some uber-popular politician or celebrity. No, we follow the humble Galilean who didn't stray from the path that took him right to the cross. Jesus told us flat, flatly, in this world, you are going to have troubles. He also said, if the world hates you, remember, they hated me first. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, the student is not above his teacher. A servant, not above his master. If the head of the house is called Beelzebub, in other words, devil, how much more the members of his household. What Jesus was saying here is that they slandered me. They're certainly going to slander you. If we are in Christ, we can expect to share some of the sufferings, troubles, and persecutions that Jesus experienced. But let's face it. We're not going to have any of the sufferings and trials that Jesus had. No, not at all. So if, if we face pushback, if we face hostility and slander, really what is that? Now faith is a gift, and Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection is a finished work. Our good works don't add anything to our salvation. But part of this gift, this salvation... Being connected to Jesus, he pours into our life a faith, love, a desire to serve him and obey him. We are connected by faith, and therefore we have, true Christians have, a determination to want to live a Christian life. And this brings me to that third reality. It's the one great fact that we need to keep in mind living the Christian life. And here it is. It's hard. It's hard. Why is it hard? The reason it's hard is because we still struggle with sin. If you say you have no sin, now here's the Bible speaking, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. We don't want to do that. Even Paul in Romans 7 uh, wrote this, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. I have a desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. Do you resonate with that? I certainly do, and I'm sorry about it. I want to tell you, I've never lived a single day of my life without sinning. Not one day. I have always fallen short of the glory of God. I'm not happy about that. I need his forgiveness every day. I'm in for the struggle. Hard is normal for the Christian life. The Christian life is struggle. But it's the only life to live. It's the good life. And we should embrace it. If it was easy, I would be wondering if I was truly a Christian. A dead fish can only go downstream, but a live one can fight the current, go against the grain. You know, if you're struggling in your Christian faith, it might, it might just be a sign to you that you are really one of the beloved, that you're a true Christian. Peter says, if you're going to suffer, then suffer for the right reasons. Don't suffer because you, 
you're a criminal or you've done bad things. No, don't, don't be that way. The growing Christian knows that troubles and hardships and suffering are used by God to refine us, to purify us, to make us more dependent on Him so that we can experience the power of the Spirit and we can really grow in our Christian faith. We entrust ourselves to God and He gives us strength. How can we use our troubles to glorify Christ? I don't know where I I got this quote from, but I I think it's such a good one. Uh, In love service, only wounded soldiers can serve. In love service, only wounded soldiers can serve. Isn't that excellent? Our own troubles humble us, and yet they make us serviceable to others. We can empathize with those who suffer with some of the same things that we have experienced. Then we can encourage them. We can point them to a God who cares for us, who says, cast your anxieties, your cares upon me because I care for you. We can encourage one another with those words. He's helped us in our time of need. He'll help those people too that we care about. We're all together in the body of Christ. That's the importance of the church. We're together as the body of Christ. So if one suffers, we really all suffer. If one is healed, we all rejoice. This is why God has knitted us together for this very purpose. We can become either students of our troubles and suffering or victims. A victim feels so sorry for himself that he has no time for others. A student focuses on helping others so he has no time to feel sorry for himself. A victim begs God to remove the problems of life so he might be happy. And yet, a student has learned through the problems of life that God alone is the source of happiness. Mother Teresa once wrote about a situation she experienced that she said she would never forget. She happened to be in Venezuela, and she intended to visit a family who had given a a lamb to the order of nuns there in Venezuela. She went to thank them, and she found out that they had a badly handicapped child. She asked the mother, what's the child's name? And the mother gave this beautiful answer. She said, the child is named Teacher of Love. Teacher of Love. Because he keeps teaching us how to love. Everything we do for him is love for God in action. Isn't that a beautiful picture? No wonder Mother Teresa didn't forget it. Teacher of love. We glorify Christ when when we avoid grumbling and complaining. Instead, have an attitude of gratitude. For we don't have, uh, we're not left bereft. We have a true treasure in Jesus Christ already. He has lavished us with his grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And listen, no suffering lasts. It's momentary. It has a short span. Because we are heading to a place as Christians where there is no trouble, no suffering, no pain, no tears. The ultimate home, and that's heaven. So whatever we experience now, we're called to endure. We're called to trust in Christ and to know that he still has us and that he loves us in spite of pain and suffering. He will never forsake us. Even in this life, you have to admit, we as American Christians are so materially blessed in amazing ways. Listen to these uh, facts. Consider if you woke up this morning with more health than illness, then you're better off than six million people who won't survive this week. If you have not experienced the dangers of war, the loneliness of prison, the agony of torture, the pangs of starvation, then you're ahead of 500 million people. 
If you can attend church without being harassed and threatened with death, maybe, or torture, then you're more blessed than three billion people in this world. And if you have food in the fridge and clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, then you're ahead of 75% of people in this world. And finally, if you have money in the bank and in your wallet, if you have some investments, then you're the top 8% of the world's wealthy. Now, you can quibble with these, these statistics, but the truth is we Christians in America are not only spiritually blessed, but we're amazingly materially blessed. Because of Him, because of Him, we can help others as they deal with their troubles and suffering. And in the end, as the Scripture says today, we will be restored, confirmed, strengthened, and established. We will be. We can rejoice because we are in Christ. And because we're in Him, we are the Beloved. We're the beloved. In the name of Jesus Christ and to his glory, amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen. Now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce a a person who will sing for us today, uh, a solo, Sarah Collins. She participated in The Voice this spring. She was made it to the made it to Kelly's team, and uh, so we're so glad that this member of our church is going to sing to us one of those beloved hymns. What a friend we have in Jesus, Sarah Collins.
Friends, isn't it amazing that we absolutely have a God who is at the same time our friend, just as Sarah sang, who gives us an overabundance of grace, just as Pastor Rich shared with us in his wonderful message. And over these last number of weeks and months, we have a God who has continuously ensured that we have provision. And we are so thankful for all the ways he blesses us. And right now, during this time of offering, we want to just share our thankfulness by giving a portion back of what is already his, that, that he gave to us to manage. And so you can do that um, online at visitgrace.org, or you can do that um, also by by mailing a, a check-in or, or stopping by the church office uh, for, your, for your tithes and offerings. We thank you for your generosity uh, during this time as, uh, as followers of Jesus. And right now, uh, we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> You promise not to abandon your people, but to be with us always, and we thank you that you always are. We pray that you would grant us grace to hear your word with faith and to receive your grace with repentant hearts and to keep what we hear and receive upon our lips now in our lives, uh, that we would connect, grow, and serve with those around us. Father, give us courage that we may give bold witness to the truth um, of your grace and your mercy and that we would proclaim our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Lord, you have the power over all things and you appoint an order on earth for the protection of the weak, the punishment of evildoers, and the encouragement of virtue. We pray that you would bless our president, our governor, all who make and minister and judge our laws and give them wisdom for the challenges of our times. Preserve them from self-serving concerns. Give us grace that we may honor the gift of liberty and be good citizens and neighbors to all. Lord, you have compassion on all who suffer. Give grace to the sick, to those with mental health issues, to the dying in their last hours, and to those who grieve. We pray for all of those in our hearts and our minds at this time. Grant them patience in all their afflictions and deliver them according to your gracious will. Lord, you are the source of all wisdom and knowledge, and we thank you for all of those who have taught those who have learned, especially those who graduate this year. Be the hope of those whose plans have been disappointed and grant that all graduates would find good employment. Guide them in the pursuit of your word and your truth to live honorable lives and worthy vocations and so that in all things you may be glorified. Father, may we continually be a people that continues to witness to those around us in person and online in whichever way that you call us to. Father, it's in the precious name of your son, Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. We now are led by the Lord's Prayer um, uh, by Casey and Tyler Bailey. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now sing our closing hymn, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be 
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. And may God continue to bless the mission he's given us, our mission to connect, grow, and serve. We now close by singing the doxology.